I have a very personal relationship to this bookstore. Um, I was a student very close by here, an undergraduate um, from a foreign country. And um, when I could get my uh, sp spirits up, I would bike to this bookstore um, and spend time here. And it's there's something wonderful about things coming back. Um, and so thank you very much for having me here. Um, and thank you for those really wonderful words of praise. Uh, I must say, though, my favorite uh, uh, praise that I received for the book uh, came this morning when I was reading through my emails, and someone sent me a little uh, a note uh, from some blogger who says, are there cliff notes for the emperor of all maladies? <laughs> And it was my, it's been my lifelong ambition to have a book to which there are cliff notes. <laughs> so um, if anyone is inspired to write cliff notes, please let me know. I'd be delighted. <laughs> um, I, I thought I would begin today, rather than talking about um, the content of the book, um, I thought I would begin today by talking about process, because that's more interesting. It's something you don't get from just reading the book itself, uh, sort of a behind-the-scenes look about what motivated some parts of the book and how they got written. Um, the, first, I have to offer a note of apology, which is, of course, that this book was, when it, when it was finally handed in as in its draft form, was three times its length. Um, uh, and th by necessity, a vast amount of information had to be cut. You cannot. There is a fundamental, you know, my, my, my editor said, 500 pages is the final limit no more, and we ended up with about 600, and that was a, a bargain. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, so I, I have to start with a, with a note of apology, saying that not every story could make it into the book, um, so I would welcome other attempts to write um, further histories of, of, a, of a disease that will continue to be part of our lives in the, in the future. Um, that said, um, I um, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, as I said, the process of writing the book, and and the first moment, the most one of the most pivotal moments in the writing of the book happened sometime early on when I was when I was confronting the the vastness of the challenge. And the vastness of the challenge is here: you have a, a history that spans about four thousand odd years, and there are about a hundred odd characters that move in and out of the book. Uh, there are scientific terms. Um, there's the, sometimes the, in their political terms. There's politics, science, and of course, in the middle of all of this are this kind of whirl of stories. And um, I was having a conversation with my, with my very excellent editor, Nan Graham, um, and she said to me something very pivotal. She said, um, we were talking about something completely different, and she said, in the end, said, if, if one forgets the book publishing industry, so if one forgets for a second the vast paraphernalia that allows a book to come into play, the bookstore, the, you know, the actual product, the printer, the, the, the business of bookmaking, the marketing, etc., she said, you know, in the end, a book is an amazing instrument by which one author sitting alone in a room can talk to one reader sitting alone in a room. And that comment resonated with me very deeply because I thought to myself, well, if you forget for a second the vast paraphernalia of medicine, the CAT scans, the MRIs, the, the billion-dollar devices, the National Cancer Institute, the wonderful crown jewels of medicine that exist in this country and others, in the end, the act of medicine is a mechanism by which one person sitting alone in a room can talk to another person sitting alone in a room. One doctor sitting alone in a room can talk to one patient sitting alone in a room. Um, and that analogy was very deep for me um, because it reminded me what was it, about what was essential and what was not essential. And the essential piece of it was that much like a book, medicine is about storytelling. Medicine begins with the most shamanic act. Um, if you take away all its paraphernalia, ultimately medicine begins with someone saying, tell me your story, what happened? Um, and that is the first thing that happens when you meet a doctor. Um, is that you begin to unpack um, a story. And, and as I make a claim in the book, the doctors then tell a story back um, to you. Um, and it's this interchange, it's an ancient interchange, probably one of the most ancient, one of the most, um, ancient interchanges that we have as human beings. Um, and that itself, that process in itself, begins 
begins the unpacking or unburdening of an, il of an illness. Um, long before you receive your first dose of whatever medicine you will or will not receive, it is the unburdening of a story that is the first shamanic act of medicine. And actually, if you forget that, it seems to me that something very important will stop happening in medicine. Um, and once I had come to that realization, again inspired by this comment, um, it began to become very clear to me how one could write this book. Um, again, remembering that there was a vast history here, but it could be written through the eyes of patients. It could be written by telling stories. And if I could tell stories um, that began and at whatever point of time, 4,000 years ago, and if I could fulfill those stories, if I could flesh out these stories, then what, would, what seemed like an insurmountable problem, which is how does one tell this history, um, would become actually solvable, um, which is tell the history by moving from story to story to story, typically focusing on those who were right there, those who experienced it most directly, and that is patience. Now, again, that was the solution in principle of the problem. But then that raises a second question, which is how does one find these missing stories? Um, how, how does one uncover the, the story of a w woman who experienced breast cancer in the 1950s? Remember, um, I, I, I recount um, a moment in time, in 1950 in fact, when a, young, when a woman, uh, Fanny Rosenau, uh, calls up the New York Times and she says, I'd like to place an advertisement um, for survivors of breast cancer. And the New York Times, the society editor, gets on the phone and says, well, Ms. Rosenau, actually, you know, we can't print the words breast and cancer in the New York Times. What if we said um, we were, uh, this was a survivor's group of women with diseases of the chest wall? Um, this is 1950. And actually, when the New York Times came to, came to write about my book, I said to Chip McGrath, I said, make sure you print that, because it's a reminder for us, all of us, including us on doctors, that we, we need to be humble about you know, what, what, what can and cannot be achieved here. Um, so this was the background. Again, these missing stories, a word that can't be uttered, uh, a word that's whispered about, um, the big C. Um, and again, the question was, you know, wh what were the stories? Um, and one thread that came very early on is that I knew that somewhere in this story would have to be the story of one of the most remarkable um, uh, women um, in, recent med in recent intellectual history, and that is Mary Lasker. Mary Lasker, who, um, um, among many other things, directed her philanthropic energies. She was a very unusual woman for her times, um, an entrepreneur, um, a um, person who uh, then directed an enormous amount of philanthropic energy towards um, solving, um, uh, as, he, as she put it, um, uh, transforming the geography of American health, the landscape of American health. And if, 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 if there was one sort of central character spinning through the story, it would be Mary Lasker. And from Mary Lasker then, it, very quickly, um, I, I, I found Sidney Farber, who actually begins the book. Sidney Farber was Mary Lasker's friend, uh, a scientific collaborator. And if Mary Lasker gave uh, political legitimacy to the war on cancer, Sidney Farber provided a kind of scientific legitimacy to, for, um, for, for, the, for the war on cancer. So the book then begins with Sidney Farber. Um, Sidney Farber was a pathologist. Um, uh, we begin in the 1940s. He was a doctor, he was so called the doctor of the dead because, in primarily, pathologists in the 1950s would perform autopsies. It was very, um, he was a pathologist who specialized in children's um, pathology. And um, typically, uh, bodies of children who had died in the hospital would be wheeled down into his basement laboratory. The laboratory was no bigger than about you know, 12 feet by, by about uh, 12 feet, uh, uh, kind of a frozen cube at the bottom of, of one of the buildings of the Dana-Farber. So that's where we are in 1948. And then um, Farber became interested in trying to find uh, a mechanism or, or an understanding of a disease which was ex extremely lethal, a swiftly lethal form of cancer, and that was childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And that's where our story begins. Um, uh, lymphoblastic leukemia is a disease that typically, although not always, affects children. Um, and usually, uh, in the 1950s, it was almost uniformly lethal, 100% mortality. Often kids would die, they would be diagnosed um, within, and they would die in the span of a week, two weeks. Sometimes they would live longer and then die soon after. So Farber became particularly interested in this. And one of the reasons was that leukemia, unlike many other forms of cancer, could be counted. 
And as I talk about in this book, science begins with measurement. Uh, whenever you can measure something, you can begin to perform a scientific activity on it. And this was a time before CAT scans and MRIs, so it was very hard to count the size of an internal tumor because it was buried inside.